Previously, we talked about what an FPGA is and what it's good for. Before we get our hands dirty with Verilog, we need to install the tool chain. Lucky for us, there are free and open source tools that work with the FPGA on our dev board. Let's get started. If you head to yosishq.net, you can learn about these tools. The Yosis tool synthesizes Verilog RTL code. Note that it specifically supports the 2005 version of Verilog, so that's what we're going to use. If you check the FAQ, you can see the different FPGA targets that it supports. We'll be using a Lattice ICE 40. Click on Next PNR and you'll be taken to a GitHub page. Here, you can see a visualization of how Next PNR works. It's quite literally making connections between cells in the FPGA. The output of the place and route step then goes to tools in the Project Ice Storm suite. Scroll down and you can read about the individual tools. We'll be using IcePack to convert the ASCII output of the PNR tool to a binary that's readable by the FPGA. Finally, IcePROG uploads the binary file to the FPGA. To make life easier, we're going to use Opio. This is a tool that manages all of the tools we just looked at. It provides methods for installing them on all of the major operating systems through Python. It also comes with a number of examples that can be good starting points. However, note that where the tools can be made to work with just the chips on custom boards, Opio is really intended to support various development boards that you can buy. If you do make a custom development board, I'm sure you can do a pull request to have it supported in Opio. I also want to point out this ICE Studio project. ICE Studio is a block-based coding environment for Verilog. You can see it in action in some of these GIFs. It runs Opio and the other tools we saw earlier in the background, so it only supports Lattice ICE 40 chips at the moment. For now, I want to stick with Verilog and the command line tools so you can get a sense of how raw HDL works. If there's interest, I'll come back to ICE Studio later in the series. For example, here is a RISC-V soft-core CPU being used in iStudio. This graphical environment might be an easier way for some to visualize and organize larger projects than, say, pure hardware description language. Opio is still a relatively new project, so expect some changes as it's updated. The Read the Docs page for Opio is the best place I have found for information on installing and using it. You'll want to follow the installation guide for your particular operating system, but I'll show you the process on Windows. Note that you need to have Python 3.5 or greater installed on your computer. In the User Guide section, you can see how to use Opio to build, simulate, and upload your design to the board. Note that each of these commands actually calls one or more tools in the background, like Yosis and NextPNR. To start, make sure you're using a version of Python that's 3.5 or greater. Go through the process of installing Python if it's not already on your system. From there, we're going to use pip to install Appio. However, note that I'm specifically installing version 0.6.7 of Appio. At least at this time, the newest version had issues with installing some of the tools, so I'm going to be sticking with 0.6.7 as that's known to work on my system. In the future, current versions may work and you may not run into some bugs, but this was noted on the issues page in the GitHub repository for Appio, that they are currently updating a lot of the things in backend for Appio, so I recommend sticking with 0.6.7 for now. Appio should now work as a command line tool in your console. If you have issues where it's not recognized as being part of a path, you might have to add wherever Appio is located to your path. I ran into this on some flavors of Linux, but for Windows, it seems to work out of the box after installing it using pip. From there, we need to install the tool suite. This is things like Yosis and IceStorm. It doesn't come packaged with Appio, so we need to use Appio to install them. From there, we tell Appio to install the various drivers to support talking to our board. Take a look at your board. If it has an FTDI chip, you will need to install the specific drivers to work with that FTDI chip. If you're using an iStick like I am, it does contain an FTDI chip, so we need to do this extra step. 
If you're on Windows, you'll want to open a command prompt as administrator. To install the FTDI drivers, we'll need to call opio drivers dash dash FTDI dash enable. When we run that, at least in Windows, you'll get Zadig to pop up and we have to go through this process manually. If you're on another operating system, you shouldn't need to do this step. In Zadig, click Options and list all devices. Plug in your FPGA dev board. Click the drop-down list and you should see your dev board listed. It might say something like Lattice if you've used a board like this before. It might also be an FTDI chip or something like that. You can also view the list before and after plugging it in to find the new addition to the list. So I'm gonna click my Lattice dev board here and Opio wants the lib USB K driver to be installed. So we'll select that and click replace driver. Give it a moment to install the specific driver for communicating with the FTDI chip. When it's done, click close, close out of Zadig, and you can close the administrator command prompt. Now you should be able to say opio system dash dash ls FTDI to list the various FTDI connected parts. You should see a Lattice FT USB interface cable. That means it's connected to our dev board. There is an issue I have found specifically with Windows. If you have another FTDI chip connected in addition to your dev board, you will probably run into this lib USB open failed. In this example, I plugged in my Analog Discovery 2, which uses something similar to communicate with USB, and having both the iStick and the Analog Discovery 2 plugged in caused this error. So if you see this, that probably means you need to disconnect all of your other FTDI devices except for your particular dev board. So when I disconnect my Analog Discovery 2, I run that command again, and sure enough, it pops up with my dev board being connected. The first thing we want to do is create a folder that houses all of our projects that we're going to be creating. For me, I'm going to go into my documents folder in my home directory and create a directory called Opio. We'll go into Opio and store our various projects here. One of the cool things about Opio is that it comes with a bunch of examples. We can call Opio examples L to list out the examples that are available. Feel free to scroll through these to get an idea of what we can instantiate, look at, and modify. I'm gonna be working with the ice stick examples. Specifically, let's start with LEDs as that one's pretty simple. We can just call the name of that example with opio examples D and then ice stick backslash examples. As you can see, that creates an ice stick directory. If we go into there, you can see that it creates an LEDs directory inside of iStick. If we go in there, we can see all of the files that were created as part of this example. Let's go into the file browser and take a look at what was actually made. So we created this opio directory, we created iStick and LEDs inside of that. Our main design, it's not actually a program, is in the leds.v file. So let's open that and take a look. Feel free to look through this. This is a basic Hello World example. All it does is tie all of the LEDs to high, and it just turns them on. The other important file is this .pcf file, which is the physical constraints file, or maybe pin constraint file, as it tells us how things are connected on the actual board or chip itself. This isn't really Verilog code. Comments are given by these pound signs or hashtags. And then what it does is it gives a label, in this case D1, and assigns it to the physical pin number on the chip. So on our FPGA, pin 99, that's physical pin 99, is mapped to D1, and that's the first LED on the board. And that's how we get these names when we call them in our LEDs Verilog file. If we head to the latticesemi.com ICE40 page, you can zoom down and you're looking for I believe it's documentation. We're using the ICE40 HX1K. That is the FPGA chip that's on our ICE stick. So click that to download this spreadsheet and you'll want to open it in something like Excel. The ICE stick has the 144 pin TQFP package. So these are the physical part numbers labeled one through 144. And I mentioned that 99 is connected to that first LED. So here's pin 99. 
you can see that it is indeed a PIO connected to one of the IO banks. And the next thing you want to do is find the iStick user manual. And if you scroll through this, you can usually find something like a schematic. Here are the LEDs. So D1, that's what the label was. That's connected to a net called LED0. And the actual FPGA schematic symbol is divided up into a number of these blocks. But you can see here, pin 99, physical pin 99, is connected to LED0. And you can also find this chart, user IOs and LEDs, so D1's connected to 99, and so on. And it gives you the color of the LED. So hopefully those two documents can help you figure out how the pins are connected to various things on the dev board and where you can find the physical pin number when you're creating that .pcf file. The other thing worth looking at is the test bench. So the first test bench is written in Verilog, and you can see it here. We're actually not going to be using test benches or writing our own for at least a few episodes because we want to get the basics of Verilog down before we start writing these. However, it's always a good idea to create a test bench to simulate your design and see if it works before sending it off to your FPGA and especially before deployment. The LEDs underscore TB dot V is the Verilog test bench that actually runs the test bench. The program that reads that in and runs simulation is GTK Wave. This is a save state so that when we load up GTK Wave, it reads this in and it runs the simulation right away, basically. The other thing you'll notice is this APO.ini initialization file. If we look in here, it just says, hey, the board that's supported for this project is the ice stick. We can actually create this file by using Apio. What I'm going to do here is delete it and then go back to my console and we can say Apio boards dash dash list and you can see the list of supported boards at least for this particular version and we want the ice stick. So I'm going to do Apio init dash dash board and say ice stick. All that does is recreate that apio.ini file. So if you're creating a project from scratch, you'll probably want to do this so that it tells apio that you're working with the ice stick. You can tell the syntax is a little different, but either should work. Now that we have all of the components for our project together, the first thing I recommend doing is calling apio verify. This performs a verification step using this iverilog tool. And this just kind of says, hey, the syntax looks good. We think you can synthesize this and you're ready to go. From there, you'll probably want to simulate. This is always a good idea before actually sending out the project or design to the actual board. In this case, the simulation step opens up GTK Wave. It loads in that test bench Verilog code and it also loads in that .gtkw save state so that GTK Wave opens up with certain signals here and toggles them in a certain pattern. But for now, we're just looking at the output LEDs and they should just be always on. When you're happy with the way this looks, close out of GTK Wave and we want to say Apio build. This calls Yosis to perform the synthesis step for our Verilog code. And then it calls next PNR to do placing and routing. This is where that pins configuration file or the physical constraints file is read in and it figures out how to route the individual connections and set the cells in the chip itself, which is the ICE 40 HX 1K because the Verilog code was agnostic to a particular chip, but placing and routing then takes that agnostic design and creates some output that is unique to this particular chip. IcePack then takes that ASCII file and packages it up into a binary file that can be read by the chip itself. Assuming we get a success here, we can call Apio upload. Make sure your board is plugged in and on. This will call IcePROG that will take the binary file and send it over to the flash memory of your board. Assuming the upload process worked, all of the LEDs on the board should be on. I highly recommend going back to the lattice page where we downloaded the pinout document. 
clicking on data sheet and finding the data sheet for the ICE 40HX part. So we're going to download that and open it up. Scroll through here and I recommend using this as a reference and you're going to find this diagram which kind of shows the internal working of the actual FPGA. These PLB or programmable logic blocks contain a number of cells and in fact on the next page you can see that each block contains eight logic cells. And these are the cells we looked at in the first episode and we're going to be looking at the individual parts of a cell in future episodes and breaking it down as we learn about things like lookup tables and combinatorial logic as well as the D flip-flops and how these can be combined to create your digital logic. But for this overall view, note that these blocks can be connected to one another. We have access to some RAM. There's also I.O. banks and these I.O. banks have a little bit of their own logic. You can think of many of the pins as being similar to what you would find on a microcontroller and you can configure them to be a input pin and output pin. Uh, you can sometimes configure pull ups or pull down resistors that are inside of these I.O. banks and connected to each pin or groupings of pins. This particular part also has some dedicated spy logic. There's also a phased lock loop that will provide us with clock signals and we're going to explore those in a future episode. You also have this non-volatile configuration memory. Note, and this is very important, this particular memory on this part is a one-time write only. So if you are satisfied with your design and you don't want to change it any longer and you're ready for deployment, you can burn it to this little amount of memory here. But once you do, that's it. That part is burned and ready to go. Otherwise, there's configuration logic that will read from an externally connected flash chip from SPY usually, and that's what gets read in and configures the chip. And that sets the cells to behave in certain ways, makes connection between cells and among the blocks to create your design on the actual component itself, on the FPGA. You can read in that configuration any number of times, but that's why you'll often see external spy flash chips accompanying FPGA components on boards. And indeed, our iStick has an external flash chip on it so that when we send our program, that binary file using Opio Upload, that gets loaded into the spy flash chip. Every time you restart or disconnect power from this FPGA, it loses all of the memory and all of the configuration. So each time you boot it up, it has to re-read it in from that flash chip and then reconfigure everything, which is why it will take a few moments before the FPGA starts doing anything uh, when you give it power. Your challenge for this lesson is to modify the LEDs.V example so that one of the LEDs is off. You can see here that I've turned off the green LED. Your solution might be a little different, but I'll make sure that a link to my solution is in the description if you'd like to compare answers. At this point, we're ready to start creating our own FPGA projects. In the next episode, I'll show you how to make combinations of logic gates in Verilog. Happy hacking!